keynote speaker at the awards dinner given by the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Live coverage beginning at 9.30 Eastern here on C-SPAN. And now we take you live to Capitol Hill for a hearing on policy yes, towards Iraq. Really the House Government Reform here. Committee will get an Israeli perspective uh, on the issue from former Israeli like Prime make, Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, live coverage here on C-SPAN. A couple of brief comments. Uh, President uh, Bush appeared before the United Nations today, and I think he made a very strong case uh, for uh, holding Saddam Hussein accountable for his actions and inactions. The President stated, and I think most of my colleagues and I saw this speech, the President stated in no uncertain terms that almost every one of the UN resolutions that had been agreed to by Saddam Hussein has been violated by him. I won't enumerate all of them, but I think the President made a very, very strong case. Uh, I know there's a lot of uh, uh, concern about the problems in the Middle East and Iraq and whether or not we should uh, take military action to eliminate the threat by Saddam Hussein. And so today I hope that uh, uh, listening to one of the foremost experts on the Middle East, Benjamin Netanyahu, will be able to have a lot of those questions answered. Uh, I've had the privilege of uh, meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu on a number of times, a number of occasions, and heard him uh, speak uh, on issues concerning the Middle East and, in particular, Iraq. And I am convinced he's one of the most knowledgeable people uh, on this issue that, uh, that I've had the pleasure to talk to. And with that, uh, I want to welcome Mr. Netanyahu. I will now yield to uh, uh, Mr. Kucinich, who is uh, uh, going to make an opening statement, I believe, on behalf of uh, Mr. Waxman. Uh, I, actually, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm uh, making this statement on my behalf. Uh, Mr. Waxman, I think, will have a statement which his staff will submit for the record. Well, with that objection, we'll put it in the record. Thank you. I appreciate the Prime Minister's presence here today and his willingness to speak to our committee. It seems to me that, uh, and to many others that one of the largest threats that Israel faces is terrorism. Israelis have repeatedly been victims of the horrific tactics of terrorism and intimidation. A year ago, the United States truly felt the brunt of, of this tactic. But our nation has shown determination in bringing to justice those responsible for this attack. And as Prime Minister Netanyahu stated last year to this very committee, on September 20, 2001, at a meeting I was pleased to attend. There are many terrorist militants all over the region that continue to operate uh, terrorist missions to attack the United States, Israel, and other nations. For the past few months, the rationale for linking Iraq and uh, Saddam Hussein was supposed to link the terrorist attacks against the United States. Uh, Iraq, it's at this moment, to the best of our knowledge, does not harbor terrorists who threaten the United States. The U.S. administration recently admitted, after months and months of talk, that there's no evidence of, of Iraq being tied to September 11th. So uh, one of the questions I hope that we can get to today is why is the Iraq threat more severe now than ever before? One of the questions that's been raised is exactly what are the military capabilities of Iraq? Yesterday's Washington Post noted that senior intelligence officials did not have an up-to-date assessment of Iraq's nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons capacities. The administration so far has not presented credible evidence of, of a threat uh, uh, to the American people or this Congress. I wonder if Prime Minister Netanyahu will be able to present us with uh, tangible evidence about Iraq's present uh, nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons capabilities. Now, I believe that our nation uh, should work with Israel to focus efforts to bring about a solution to the crisis in the Middle East between Israel and the Palestinians. I think the United States is in a role to uh, serve as an honest broker in working with both parties to bring about a resolution of that uh, very tragic condition. Uh, diplomatic efforts, I believe, have not been fully examined in the case of Iraq. And while Iraq is in defiance of, of uh, certain uh, UN orders, no one can seem to prove to this point that Iraq poses an imminent threat to this country or to any other nation. 
If the real worry is that Iraq is seeking weapons of mass destruction and may in the future plan to use them against its neighbors and the United States, then it would follow that inspections need to resume. Inspections have been proven to be effective in the elimination of Iraq's weapons. This is called preventive diplomacy, not preventive war. Uh, I, Israel, I believe, would benefit considerably from a commencement in the United Nations-led inspections in Iraq. If the threat that the U.S. and Israel face is the capability of Iraq to deliver weapons of mass destruction, uh, if they have them and the ability to deliver, we should, of course, eliminate uh, those weapons, find them, and dismantle them. Uh, but I would hope that as we proceed with the uh, considerable intelligence of, of Mr. Netanyahu, that we not lose an opportunity to make still one more effort at trying to resolve our conditions uh, of dispute with Iraq through the international community without the United States taking unilateral action and with an intention that we might be able to resolve this without resorting to war. I thank Mr. Netanyahu for being here and I look forward to his testimony. Are there other members that uh, wish to make an opening statement, Mr. Barr? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as uh, you set the example, I'll uh, submit a written statement uh, in more detail, but I also want to uh, thank the uh, Prime Minister for being here today. I also want to uh, draw attention to the President's speech today, which included very important elements in the war against terrorism. I think the President did a masterful job of laying out a sound basis uh, for any number of options in the interest both of the United States uh, and the world uh, against terrorism and uh, despotism. I think the President's uh, message uh, left the United States in a very solid position to exercise perhaps one of the most important tools in the fight against terrorism, and that is flexibility. Uh, not to tie oneself down to outside factors, uh, but to always remain focused on maintaining maximum number of options with which to deal with terrorism, which itself uh, maintains uh, by its definition uh, tremendous flexibility. So I want to take this opportunity to commend uh, President Bush for a masterful job of laying out uh, the case uh, for uh, military action should it become necessary, but at the same time leaving options open. And uh, at least uh, by his actions today before the United Nations, preventing uh, anyone from raising legitimate concerns or criticisms uh, of the President for not uh, making every effort to secure uh, the, uh, uh, the backing of uh, international organizations and our allies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome um, our witness, former Prime, Israeli Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, to our hearing. It's good to see you again. Uh, the last time we met was in this room on September 20, 2001, right after the horrible terrorist attacks of September 11th. At that time, Prime Minister Netanyahu conveyed the grief, empathy, and solidarity of the entire world when he said, today we are all Americans. And he spoke with great force and eloquence about the need to confront terrorism. Now we're considering a different question, whether the United States should take military action against Iraq. This question is not an easy one, and it raises complex issues to which Congress has not yet received answers. Should the United States push for the return of the international inspectors? Uh, should we seek from the Security Council a resolution authorizing the use of force? What effects will a war on Iraq have on the war against terrorism? And what is the plan for Iraq after uh, hostilities end? The nation and the world were uni united in pursuing al-Qaeda, but this consensus is lacking on Iraq. There are significant differences of opinion in the international community. There are differences of opinion within the United States. There are even differences of opinion within the Bush administration itself. It is appropriate for us to give special attention to the implications for Israel of war against Iraq. As the Gulf War demonstrated, Israel will most likely be the first target of an Iraqi regime bent on retaliation. Iraq fired over 40 Scud missiles at Israel during the Gulf War, causing severe damage, casualties, and deaths. Throughout that conflict, Israeli citizens lived under the daily threat of chemical and biological warfare. Israelis will face similar risks and challenges if there is another war against Iraq. 
But while the topic of this hearing is important, I regret that the minority was not consulted in advance about witnesses for today's hearing. This hearing is entitled Conflict with Iraq and Israeli Perspective. Yet to the best of my knowledge, the chairman did not send invitations to a single member of the current Israeli government. Moreover, the chairman did not agree to invite other experts in Israeli foreign policy until yesterday, which was not sufficient notice to allow other witnesses to attend. Although Mr. Netanyahu was indeed uh, Prime Minister of Israel and is respected widely for his expertise, I'm sure he would agree that he represents uh, his point of view and maybe uh, a point of view that's widespread, but it is uh, one point of view. There are other witnesses as well that we should have, have before this committee. I wrote to Chairman Burton on Monday asking him to invite administration witnesses so that we could find out how the Bush administration plans on working with Israel and our allies in the region. But we have no witnesses from the administration. We also do not have witnesses who can testify about the implications of military action in Iraq on other countries in the Middle East. A military confrontation with Iraq may well be necessary but it is a decision fraught with consequences for the United States, the Mideast, and the rest of the world. We need to hear the broadest possible spectrum of views so that we can make as an informed decision as possible about this vital issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Connie, Ms. Morell. I will submit my full statement for the record, but I just want to uh, welcome Prime Minister Netanyahu and uh, point out what we all know, and that is today's hearing is a topic uh, of central importance both to the American people and to the world. And it's necessary, I believe, that Congress debate the merits of an invasion of Iraq, learn the perspective of our allies, determine whether an imminent attack is the wisest course of action. And I do indeed have serious reservations about an attack, but I look forward to hearing from uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, particularly the ramifications for Israel. If we do not attack, what may happen to Israel? If we do attack, what may happen to Israel? And I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morello. Mr. Clay. Thank you for yielding, Mr. Chairman. I, too, will deliver an abbreviated opening statement and submit the, uh, in, in its entirety to the record. Uh, I, I, too, would like to welcome our distinguished guest, former Prime Minister Netanyahu, to this panel. I certainly appreciate having your perspective on this highly contentious issue, uh, the conflict with Iraq. Uh, this issue has spawned many different points of view. There is, however, a consensus that exists between our two countries. Uh, we both believe without question that Saddam Hussein must be removed. Saddam's continued existence in the region serves to further aggravate an opportunity for real peace and cooperation between Israel and its Arab neighbors. Uh, I realize that for the present moment, many questions still remain unanswered. Uh, Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu, I am very interested to learn your opinion on how a new Iraqi regime might be different from the one that is currently in place. Additionally, I am interested in knowing your thoughts about the impact of regional destabilization and the potential loss of additional American and Israeli lives. Uh, and, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to submit my statement in, in, into the record. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Without objection, so ordered. Are there further statements by my, Mr. Micah? It's <coughs> nice to see you, Mr. Micah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. It's good, always good to be with you and welcome uh, former Prime Minister Netanyahu. Um, uh, just a very brief statement that uh, uh, while I welcome Prime Minister's uh, advice and counsel. I think that uh, we all need to remember that it's the responsibility under the Constitution of the United States for the President of the United States to make a decision uh, in our national security. Now, I know uh, war uh, does require some advice and consent of the, of the uh, Congress. But we have to remember what we're dealing with here is someone who has gassed his own population, someone that less than, uh, a little over a decade ago lobbed missiles 
uh, into Israel killing people. Uh, and he did, at that time, he didn't have the technology. Uh, at that time, he didn't have the technology that he may have today. Uh, and whether it's delivered by a missile or some other means, uh, we've seen that his goal is to destroy, uh, destroy not only Israelis, but destroy world peace in the United States in the process. So I think it's time that we get a little uh, starch in our spines and realize the threat uh, that we face, that we back the President of the United States. It's nice to have this discussion, but only he is provided with the intelligence uh, uh, and the information on, uh, on proceeding and he should make that decision, uh, and we should support uh, that decision. Uh, at Memorial Day, I visited uh, Europe and, and followed the president uh, through the, the graves at Normandy and visited other, uh, other of our cemeteries. Uh, the landscape of Europe is littered with American dead who've gone in uh, to bail out uh, our weak need allies who have slept while there have been holocausts, uh, who have delayed taking action uh, when others have been slaughtered. Uh, and I don't think this is the time. Uh, we know the terrorists weren't interested in killing 2,800 in the World Trade Center. They wanted to kill 28,000 in each, uh, each tower. And, Again, it's nice to have this debate, this discussion, but I think we need to back the President of the United States, and I would strongly support his uh, action based on what we now know uh, to go uh, after Saddam Hussein. Thank you, and yield back. Thank you, Mr. Micah. Uh, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I simply want to welcome the Prime Minister to uh, this committee. You've been here before. and. I had the opportunity to visit with you in Jerusalem uh, shortly after you assumed the position of Prime Minister. We always welcome your input and your counsel, and I admire you greatly for your advocacy of democracy, which I've heard you speak of on many occasions. So thank you for being with us. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Since that was so short, we'll go to Mr. Tierney if he has an opening comment. Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to forego my remarks and just welcome the witness here and thank him for his time and his perspective on that. And uh, I know that these hearings, I suspect, will be broadened out. We'll hear other perspectives also that we'll all benefit from. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Uh, any other comments on our side? I apologize, Mr. Chairman. I, I wasn't going to make a statement. and I'll still try to be brief. I certainly want to add my words of welcome to the former Prime Minister, as I hope you can tell, sir, you have many admirers, uh, amongst whom I count myself, uh, and many, many admirers as well for the great spirit and, uh, and the great determination of the Israeli people. As you've also probably heard, we have some disagreements on some of the particulars that uh, lie behind this issue and, and why we are particularly interested uh, in hearing your comments and your very unique uh, perspective and expertise. And I'm just going to make uh, a simple request of my colleagues. Uh, all of us uh, who have the honor of serving here, of course, are, are very busy. Uh, but I've heard some remarks here today about what we do and what we don't know about what are allegations and what are not. Um, I had an opportunity this morning to go to a meeting with some other members where we were given a document that I see is amongst those in our briefing book booklets here today. And it's the backgrounder that uh, the administration put out, a decade of deception and defiance, that I think every member, as we face this weighty issue, would uh, serve themselves and their nation well by reviewing very carefully. Because as you look through it, it details, not based on supposition, not based on unconfirmed intelligence reports, not based upon opinion, but based upon a very clear record of deception a very clear record of the kinds of capabilities that we know for a fact confirmed by the United Nations that Saddam Hussein has developed. It confirms the enormous amounts <clears throat> of armaments, of chemical weapons, 
uh, and precursors that are unaccounted for and that any reasonable person would have to assume are still in existence. Uh, you can draw your own determinations from that, my colleague, but I think that as we, as we deliberate on this issue, uh, the, the facts are probably the most persuasive argument, uh, and the facts are established, and, and I think we should all do our best to uh, familiarize ourselves with them. So I would just make that respectful, I hope, respectful uh, suggestion to, uh, to all of us, myself included. And again, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, welcome. Well, I'd be happy to... Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask uh, unanimous consent that this be, uh, document be made part of the record. I think that's very important. I thank the gentleman. Without objection, so ordered. Yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank, uh, you. Are, thank you, Mr. McHugh. Are there further comments by the members of the committee? If not, uh, it's, it was asked of me uh, uh, how this meeting came about, and uh, I was in uh, Israel last week. I had the opportunity to talk uh, along with my colleagues in our CODEL with uh, Shimon Perez, the foreign minister, as well as Mr. Netanyahu. And I would like maybe uh, the former prime minister to comment on this, but it was my impression, and I think the impression of my colleagues, both Democrat, Republicans, and independents who were on the trip with us, that uh, there is, uh, while Likud and Labor do have differences of opinion, they seem to be of one mind regarding the threat that emanates from Iraq regarding Saddam Hussein. And so if you would uh, illuminate on that, Mr. Netanyahu, I'd appreciate it. And with that, uh, you're welcome to address the committee. Is your mic on, sir? Is it on, on? There you go. Uh, thank you, Chairman Burton. It's, it's a pleasure being with all of you, and I appreciate the thoughtful remarks and thoughtful questions. Uh, from uh, all of you distinguished representatives. I will try to uh, address uh, your questions uh, in uh, the course of my uh, opening remarks and in the question and answer session that will follow it, uh, because I think they're valid and important, all of them. Uh, and they need, I think the world needs, uh, this discussion and uh, other discussions that will be taking place in this uh, capital of liberty. Last year, um, a few days after September 11th, I was given the privilege of appearing before this committee to discuss the issue of terrorism. But I have to tell you that had I been given the opportunity to speak before September 11th, I, I believe I would have offered pretty much the same suggestions about how the war on terrorism should be fought and how it can be won. I would have pointed out that the key to defeating terrorism lies in deterring and destroying the regimes that harbor, abet, and aid terror. I would have argued that to root out terror, the entire network of terror, that is a network that consists of some half a dozen terrorist regimes and some two dozen terror organizations affiliated with them, that this entire terror network had to be brought down. And most important, I would have warned that the greatest danger facing our world is the ominous possibility that any part of this terror network would acquire nuclear weapons. Now, I, I have to be candid and say that even had I presented my views in the most coherent and persuasive fashion, I have no doubt that some of you, and perhaps most of you, would have regarded them as exaggerated and uh, even alarmist. But then came September 11th, and fiction turned into fact, and the unimaginable became real. That single day of horror alerted most Americans to the grave dangers that are now facing our world. And many Americans understand today that had Al-Qaeda possessed nuclear weapons last September, then the city of New York would not exist today. And they realized that we could all have spent yesterday grieving not for thousands of dead, but for millions. But for others around the world, I suppose the, um, the power of, ima of imagination uh, is not so acute. It appears that some people will have to once again see the unimaginable 
in front of their eyes before they are willing to do what must be done. Because how else can one explain the violent opposition, the insistent opposition to President Bush's plan to dismantle Saddam Hussein's regime? Now, I don't mean to suggest for a moment that the questions raised here and other questions are not relevant. That is, that there aren't legitimate questions about a potential operation against Iraq. Indeed, there are. But the question of whether removing Saddam's regime is itself legitimate is not one of them. And equally immaterial in my mind is the argument that America cannot oust Saddam without prior approval of the international community. Because this is a ruler who is rapidly expanding his arsenal of biological and chemical weapons. This is a dictator who has used these weapons of mass destruction against his subjects and his neighbors. And this is a tyrant who is feverishly trying to acquire nuclear weapons. The dangers posed by a nuclear-armed Saddam were understood by my country two decades ago, well before September 11th. In 1981, the late Prime Minister of Israel, Menachem Begin, dispatched the Israeli Air Force on a pre-dawn raid that destroyed the Iraqi nuclear reactor at Osirak. This probably took place months away from Saddam's ability to assemble the critical mass of plutonium for the first atomic bomb, or more than one. Now, at the time, Israel was condemned by all the world's government, even the government of our closest friend, the United States. But I think that over time, history has rendered a far kinder judgment on that act of unquestionable foresight and unmistakable courage. And I believe that it is history's judgment that should inform our own judgment today. Did Israel launch that preemptive strike because Saddam had committed a specific act of terror against us? Did we uh, coordinate our actions with the international community? Did we condition this operation on the approval of the United Nations? No, of course not. Israel acted because it understood, we understood, that a nuclear armed Saddam would place our very survival at risk. And today the United States must destroy the same regime because a nuclear armed Saddam will place the security of our entire world at risk. And make no mistake about it, if and once Saddam has nuclear weapons, the terror network will have nuclear weapons. And once the terror network has nuclear weapons, it is only a matter of time before those weapons will be used. You cannot prevent a dictator who has used terrorism in the past, who cavorts and supports and encourages terror organizations from using this weapon by giving it to someone by having them threaten to use it against his enemies. Once one of the terror regimes, once one of the principal regimes in the terror network has nuclear weapons, you cannot prevent the terror network from having nuclear weapons. Two decades ago, it was possible to thwart Saddam's nuclear ambitions by bombing a single installation. But today, nothing less than dismantling his regime will do. Because Saddam's nuclear program has fundamentally changed in those two decades. He no longer needs one large reactor to produce the deadly material necessary for atomic bombs. He can produce it in centrifuges the size of washing machines that can be hidden throughout the country. And I want to remind you that Iraq is a very big country. It is not the size of Monte Carlo. It is a big country. And I believe that even free and unfettered inspections will not uncover these portable manufacturing sites of mass death. So knowing this, I ask all the governments and others who oppose or question the president's plan to look at it from the other end of the logic. 
Do you believe that action can be taken against Saddam only after he builds nuclear bombs and uses them? And do the various critics, especially overseas, believe that a clear connection between Saddam and September 11th must be established before we have a right to prevent the next September 11th? Well, I think not. I'll try to give an analogy. All analogies are imperfect, but here is one. If you try to defeat the Mafia, you don't just go after the foot soldiers who carried out the last attack or even stop with the apprehension of the particular Don who sent them. You go after the entire network of organized crime, all the families, all the organizations, all of them. Well, likewise, if you intend to defeat terror, you don't just go after the terrorists who carried out the last attack or even the particular regime that sent them. You go after the entire network of terror all the regimes that support terror, all the organizations that they harbor, all of them. And doing this always entails the need to act before additional attacks are carried out. When the security of a nation is endangered, a responsible government has to take the actions that are necessary to protect its citizens and eliminate the threat that confronts them. And sometimes, this requires preemption. I have to say that in the history of democracies, preemption has been, in my mind, the most difficult choice for leaders to make. Because at the time of the decision, you could never prove the critics wrong. You could never show them the great catastrophe that was avoided by preemptive action. And yet we now know that had the democracies taken preemptive action to, to bring down Hitler, uh, in the 1930s, the worst horrors in history could have been avoided. And we now know, and we know this from defectors and from other intelligence, that had Israel not launched its preemptive strike on Saddam's atomic bomb factory, recent history would have taken a turn to, uh, to catastrophe. But the most compelling case for preemption against Saddam's regime, I believe, was not made by the president uh, the President's powerful words this morning, but by the savage action of the terrorists themselves on September 11th. Their wake-up call from hell has opened our eyes to the horrors that await us all tomorrow if we fail to act today. Now, I was asked by one of you about the sentiment of Israelis in the face of the palpable risks involved. My friends, I want to say that I'm here today as a, as a citizen of a country that is most endangered by a preemptive strike. For it is, I think, clear that in the last gasps of Saddam's dying regime, he will attempt to launch his rema remaining missiles, his remaining payloads, including biological and chemical payloads, at the Jewish state. And though I'm speaking here today as a private citizen, I believe and I know that I speak and reflect the sentiment of uh, not just the majority, but the overwhelming majority of Israelis in supporting a preemptive strike against Saddam's regime. And this cuts across political lines in Israel. We support this preemptive American action even though we stand on the front lines while others criticize it as they sit comfortably on the sidelines. But we know that their sense of comfort is an illusion. For if action is not taken now, we will all be threatened by a much greater peril. We support this action because it is possible today to defend against chemical and biological attack. We have gas masks, they're available. We have vaccinations, they're available. Well, there are other means of civil defense that can protect our citizens and reduce the risk to them. And indeed, a central component of any strike on Iraq must be to ensure that the Israeli government, if it so chooses, 
has the means to vaccinate every citizen of Israel before action is initiated. And I want to stress that ensuring this is not merely the responsibility of the government of Israel, but also the responsibility of the government of the United States. Let me repeat this. The government of Israel and the government of the United States must jointly ensure that the people of Israel have all the available means of civil defense before action begins. But equally I can say that no gas mask and no vaccine can protect against nuclear weapons. Uh, science hasn't yet invented such a device. And this is why regimes that have no compunction about using weapons of mass destruction and will not hesitate to give these weapons to their terror proxies, must never be allowed to acquire nuclear weapons. These regimes must be brought down before they possess the power to bring us all down. If a preemptive action will be supported by a broad coalition of free countries and the United Nations, all the better. But if such support is not forthcoming, then the United States must be prepared to act without it. International support for actions that are vital to a nation's security is always desirable, but it must never constitute a precondition. If you can get it, fine. If not, act without it. I don't want to sound like something familiar to you, but I would say if you can't get it, just do it. Now, my friends, under exceptional circumstances, public figures may sometimes be forgiven for quoting themselves, and I, uh, I hope today that you will indulge me and grant me this privilege, because nearly two decades ago I wrote the following. I said that the West can win the war against terrorism. It can expose its duplicity and punish its perpetrators and its sponsors. But it must first win the war against its own inner weakness, and that will require courage. We shall need at least three types of courage. First, statesmen must have the political courage to present the truth, however unpleasant, to their people. They must be prepared to make difficult decisions, to take measures that may involve great risks, and subject them to public criticism. Second, the soldiers who will be called upon to combat terrorists will need to show military courage. Third, the people will have to show civic courage. The citizens of a democracy threatened by terrorists must see themselves, in a certain sense, as soldiers in a common battle. They must not pressure their government to capitulate or surrender to terrorism. If we seriously want to win the war against terrorism, people must be prepared to endure sacrifice, and even should there be the loss of loved ones, immeasurable pain. Terrorism is a phenomenon which tries to evoke one feeling, fear. It is therefore understandable that the one virtue most necessary to defeat terrorism is the antithesis of fear, courage. Courage, said the Romans, is not the only virtue, but it is the single virtue without which all other virtues are meaningless. The terrorist challenge must be answered. The choices between a free society based on law and compassion and a rampant barbarism in the service of brute force and tyranny Confusion and vacillation facil excuse me, facilitated the rise of terrorism. Clarity and courage will ensure its defeat. My friends, though I wrote these words almost 20 years ago, they were never as pertinent, I think, as they are today. A year after September 11th, I am certain that this great nation possesses the three types of courage needed to defeat the monstrous evil that now confronts us. President Bush has shown courage by boldly charting a course to victory. The American military is once again prepared to shoulder the burden of defending the enemies of freedom. And most of all, the American people have summoned the necessary courage to fight back and to win. For me, the, that courage was most poignantly manifested last year on Flight 93. Because right there in the eye of the storm, ordinary citizens displayed extraordinary heroism. 
and rose to thwart the, the murderous designs of the terrorists. They thereby saved an untold number of, uh, of lives, including perhaps the lives of some people in this very room. It is, uh, I believe, that same civic courage that has been displayed this past year in the willingness of Americans to rally behind their government to wage war on terror. I recognize this courage, ladies and gentlemen, because I see it on the faces of my countrymen every day. Every day, millions of Israelis who have been subjected to an unprecedented campaign of terror have stood and stand firmly behind our government in the war against Palestinian terror. We have not crumbled, we have not run, we have stood our ground and fought back. You see, the, the terrorists and the tyrants of the world, they always get it wrong. They were wrong about Churchill's England, they are woefully wrong about Israel, and they are wrong, dead wrong, about America. And I think they simply don't have the means to understand the power of freedom. They think that by bombing our free societies, we will collapse. They see our free debate as debilitating. Uh, they would see a hearing of this kind, the questions that are raised here, as a sign of weakness. They don't understand it's a sign of enormous strength. They think our open discourse is a sign of that, of that weakness. They believe that their cult of death is stronger than our love of life. But of course they're wrong. There is nothing stronger than the will of a free people uniting to protect its life and its liberty. And now it's up to us to prove the terrorists and the tyrants wrong once again. I'm not saying it will be easy, and it certainly will demand some sacrifice. But it must be done today because tomorrow's sacrifice will be infinitely greater. Sixty years ago, Winston Churchill put it this way. If you will not fight terror when your victory will be sure and not too costly, he said, you may come to the moment when you will have to fight with all the odds against you. There may even be a worse case. You may have to fight when there is no hope of victory. My friends, this is the heart of the matter. What I said before this committee one year ago holds true today. Today, the terrorists have the power, or rather have the will, to destroy us, but not the power. Today, we have the power to destroy them. Now, we must summon the will to do so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. You know, uh, Mr. Netanyahu, in the late 30s, uh, the Churchill voice was a voice in the wilderness, and all the world, including the Prime Minister of Great Britain, didn't buy it. And it wasn't until the axe finally fell that they realized that they should have listened in the first place. I think your message today is very clear. I think it's just as clear as what Winston Churchill was trying to get across in the late 30s and unfortunately wasn't able to convince uh, the world of until it was involved in World War II. I think uh, your statement, which is very eloquent, boils down to one thing, and that is do we react to another attack on America after hundreds of thousands or millions of lives have been lost? Or do we preempt that kind of action from happening in the first place? And I think you made a very strong case today that we should support President Bush and respond before it happens. There are many of my colleagues, many of the people in this country that say, you know, to declare war on Iraq uh, would be a mistake, and we should wait and check and wait and check. But we are at war. 3,000 people lost their lives last September the 11th at the Pentagon in Pennsylvania and at the World Trade Center. And uh, we're at war. And I think people tend to forget that. We're not waiting for a war to begin. We're at war right now. And it seems to me that uh, the terrorist network to which you referred needs to be attacked and needs to be attacked as quickly as possible 
so that we don't have more severe losses than we've already experienced. And with that, let me just ask a few questions here. To your knowledge, has Iraq uh, kept its team of nuclear scientists together? And uh, is that an indication that they're going to continue to develop nuclear weapons? Also, what nations are aiding Iraqi, if you know, in the nuclear program? And of course, finally, if you might elaborate a little bit further on what you think his first use of nuclear weapons uh, might be. I can only give you the information uh, that I can divulge from my, uh, my tenure as prime minister, and it is uh, uh, three years old. Uh, the information we had was that Saddam was uh, pursuing all avenues of developing uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, he uh, uh, and the means to deliver them. I, I have to say that he was enjoying in this effort uh, the support of uh, Russian technology, and I should say Russian technologists uh, on site. Uh, they were a, a principal source, and other regimes, uh, uh, including North Korea, were su supporting that effort as well. Uh, there is no question that he uh, had not given up on his nuclear program, not whatsoever. Uh, there is also no question that he was uh, not satisfied with the arsenal of chemical and biological uh, weapons that he had and was trying to perfect them constantly. If perfect is the, the word to describe this uh, ghoulish enterprise. Uh, so uh, I think it's, I think fair, frankly it is uh, uh, not, not serious to assume that this man who 20 years ago uh, was very close to producing an atomic bomb spent the last 20 years sitting on his hands. He is not. And every indication we have is that he is uh, pursuing, pursuing with uh, abandon, pursuing with every uh, ounce of effort the uh, establishment of, uh, uh, of uh, map weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear weapons. If anyone makes an opposite assumption uh, or, or cannot draw the lines connecting the dots, that is uh, simply not an objective assessment of what is happening. Saddam is hell-bent on uh, achieving uh, atomic bombs, uh, atomic capabilities as soon as he can. Let, let, let me ask you a, a question regarding chemical and biological weapons. We've been told that there are that the Scud missiles that were launched at Israel during the Persian Gulf War, uh, if they had been uh, tipped with uh, chemical or biological weapons, the uh, uh, weapons would have been destroyed when they hit the ground. But we've been told that there are drones that uh, he has had in his possession that had in the nose of those drones the, uh, the ability to spray, if you will, chemical or biological weapons when they flew over a given target. Uh, are you familiar with that? Uh, can you elaborate on that? I'm familiar with some of this, yes. But I, I think, Mr. Chairman, that it is, it's very hard to say what the effectiveness of chemical and biological warheads will be when they actually impact on the ground. It's very hard to say. Uh, they might be intercepted in the air. We have some capability uh, to that effect in the form of the Arrow anti-ballistic missile, which is jointly developed by Israel and the United States. That's a, a very important development to, uh, uh, to stop missiles before they get there. But then again, these missiles would uh, explode in midair, and it depends what residual parts of the warhead uh, uh, materialize on the ground. Probably not much. But suppose some of these missiles are not intercepted. Suppose they come in. It is impossible right now, to the best of my knowledge, uh, from the information that we have available, to say what the extent of damage will be. Hence, the emphasis, uh, and the emphasis in my remarks, on civil protection. Assume the worst, prepare for the worst, you'll come out the best, or at least you'll minimize the risk. We have to assume that he'll fire the missiles. We cannot assume that we'll intercept all the missiles. And we cannot uh, assume that the warheads will not distribute chemical and what is worse, biological material. Um, so we must uh, take all the precautions. And it is possible, as I said, to reduce, substantially reduce the risk of such attacks, even if they get through. And this, I think, should be the focus 
of Israel and the United States before action is taken. That is, I don't think this is an ancillary part of the war aims. I think this should be built into the war aims. Israel, the most likely target, the preferred target of choice of Saddam, as has been demonstrated once, must be protected. Mr. Chair. Mr. Kucinich. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, when you were Prime Minister, did you identify the nuclear capabilities of Iraq, if any? We couldn't place an exact time. We knew that he was developing uh, these nuclear capabilities. We couldn't, uh, Mr. Kucinich, say exactly how long it would take him to uh, complete the uh, uh, the uh, uh, engineering of uh, an effective nuclear device, but our assessments kept shrinking. That is, our intelligence community, as we moved along the axis of time, the time that we assumed it would take him to create nuclear weapons, at least the assessments that I was getting as prime minister, was constantly shrinking. Uh, but we couldn't say with absolute precision uh, how long it would take him. Uh, do you have any new evidence of Iraq's uh, weapon capabilities, uh, nuclear capabilities? I, I cannot give you uh, uh, even an oblique uh, reference to uh, information in the last three years because I'm, uh, well, because I'm busy uh, going around the world visiting Washington. I'm not, oh, we appreciate uh, you being I'm not prying into uh, uh, privileged dossiers. Uh, there is a... Uh, there's this thing, need to know, and I don't really need to know right now, but I think that you can be sure uh, that when I did need to know, there was a constant upgrading of these weapons, constant upgrading of these weapons, constant efforts to, uh, uh, to make them more lethal and to expand the reach of the delivery systems to, uh, to deliver them. I, I would respectfully suggest to the Prime Minister, notwithstanding the great affection I have for Mr. Prime Minister that um, there is a need to know if the United States is being called upon to launch preemptive action against Iraq, um, there is a need to know the evidence. And um, because I, I, I share the concern that other members have articulated here about the effect that a preemptive attack on Iraq by the United States would have not only on, um, on the people of our country who would be called upon to wage that uh, and innocent civilians, but also the effect that it would have on, on Israel. Now, you stated in your remarks that um, if the United States launched a preemptive attack on Iraq, that Iraq uh, in Saddam Hussein, as you described it, dying gas, would be expected to uh, launch a counterattack on, on Israel. Um, if the United States does not launch a preemptive attack on the uh, state of Iraq, do you see any indication that Iraq is prepared to launch an attack on Israel? First of all, let me uh, let me comment on when I said I don't need to know. I meant I don't need the detailed that detailed, uh, kind of detailed information that always involves, uh, just by the nature of the information, some uh, indication of sources. And I, I, for one, try to avoid that uh, when I'm not in office. That's what I meant. But I also say that if you connect the dots, you know, here's a, here's a man who, from the minute he, is, he achieved powers, is trying to create a nuclear weapon. Uh, Twenty years ago, he's very close to producing it. He's foiled. He changes the technology to centrifuges that will prevent him being foiled again. We know that he's, in, he's taking in uh, nuclear technologists and nuclear technology from various countries. We know that uh, he's developing the means to deliver these weapons. We uh, have defectors who describe uh, how uh, uh, committed he is to this uh, above all else. So we have all these dots. And uh, we say, well, we don't know exactly what is happening. You know, it's uh, like you're about to see somebody plunge the knife into someone. You're looking through a keyhole. You followed a murderer. Uh, uh, you know that he's uh, suspected of, uh, he's already killed a few people. And you see him trailing somebody, and you're trailing him. You go, um, uh, he shuts the door. Uh, you're looking through the keyhole. And uh, you see him grasping the throat of this person, raising the knife. Uh, 
and then the light goes out, and the next thing you know is a body is found. And you can say, well, you know, I didn't actually see him uh, on flagrante in the act, if you will. Well, Mr. But, Mr. Uh, but I think, Mr. Kucinich, that it is simply not uh, reflecting the reality to assume that Saddam isn't feverishly working to develop nuclear weapons it, as we speak. The, the question I had, though, do you have any indication that Saddam Hussein is going to attack Israel? Oh, if he will attack Abs Israel. Absent a I preemptive see. launch by the United States. I think it's, uh, I cannot uh, uh, tell you that he will attack Israel at a particular time. Uh, he, I think what you have to assume, and this is a fair assumption, that he doesn't have to necessarily directly attack Israel. What you can do, what these uh, people do, for example, the Taliban regime didn't directly attack the United States. It harbored a terrorist group that did the job for them. The Taliban uh, regime did not uh, have uh, its intelligence officers uh, casing the joint, so to speak. Somebody else did it for them. Uh, if Saddam has a nuclear weapon, he could have, uh, he could use it to threaten or to actually detonate a nuclear regime directly or indirectly. He doesn't have to necessarily do it and undertake the risk of, uh, uh, of uh, response uh, by uh, Israel or by anyone else. And this is precisely the problem. The problem is you're not dealing with Iraq alone. You're dealing with a terror network. You're dealing with a system where you have proxies. We now live in a world where these regimes have proxies. Well, you know, I, I, I know my time's run out. I just, uh, uh, Mr. Netanyahu, thank you. I just want to ask one last question, and that is, um, you talk about a network of terror. Uh, are there any other nations that you would recommend that the United States launch preemptive attacks upon at this point? No, the issue is not... The issue is not, uh, first of all, are there other nations that are developing nuclear weapons? Yes. Uh, should, we, should we launch any preempt other preemptive attacks? First let me say what they are and then let me make a suggestion how to proceed. Thank you. Uh, the answer is categorically yes. Uh, the, uh, the two nations that are vying, competing with each other, who will be the first to achieve nuclear weapons uh, is Iraq and Iran. And Iran, by the way, is also outpacing Iraq in the development of ballistic missile systems that they hope will reach the eastern seaboard of the United States within 15 years. So I guess that doesn't include California, but includes Washington. Uh, but what it does, what uh, a third nation, by the way, is Libya as well. Libya is, uh, while no one is watching, uh, under the cloak, is uh, trying very rapidly to build uh, an atomic bomb capability. So you have here now three nations. Not surprisingly, all three have been implicated in the past in terrorist activity using the clandestine means of terror uh, and proxies. Uh, now, the question of, that you ask, I think, is, is vital. It's important, and that is, what do you do about it? You can fight all of them. You have to dismantle the network. And the question is, do you dismantle all of it at once? No, you didn't. The first thing you did in facing the after the wake-up call uh, on September 11th was that you took on the first regime, the obvious regime that had directly perpetrated that catastrophe. You removed the Taliban regime and you scattered Al-Qaeda, although it has not been completely destroyed yet. Now the question is, what's your next step? Knowing that three of these nations are developing nuclear weapons. This is not a hypothesis. It is fact. Iraq, Iran, and Libya are racing to develop nuclear weapons. So now what is the next step? I believe that the next step is to choose. It's not a question of whether you have to take action, choose, choose the right one. but what kind of action and against whom. I think of the three, uh, Saddam is probably in many ways a linchpin because it is possible to take out this regime with military action and the reverberations of what happens with the collapse of Saddam's regime could very well create an implosion in a neighbor regime like Iran for the simple reason that Iran has, I don't want to say a middle class, but it has a very large population that uh, is, uh, that might bring down the regime just as it brought down the Shah's regime. So I, uh, I think that uh, the choice of going after Iraq is like removing a brick that holds a lot of other bricks and might cause uh, this structure to crumble. It is not guaranteed. The assumption of regime removal in Iraq, an implosion in Iran, an implosion in Libya is an assumption. It is not guaranteed. 
But if I had to choose, should there be military action first against Iraq or first against Iran, I would choose exactly what the president has chosen, to go after Iraq. Who would you choose second? I would wait and see what the effects are. And I think that the effects could be quite mighty and startling. Uh, this region, the, the political culture in this region is not one, and in this society, is not one of uh, respecting force. It is worshiping force. And the determination and resolution of uh, the United States in applying it. I think that uh, this could uh, have uh, beneficial effects that might preclude the application of further uh, military action. I'm not saying that you should disavow it from the start, but I'm saying that the more resolutely and quickly you act now, the more victories you gain up front, the more victories you might end up uh, gaining later without the need to apply uh, such overt military power. Mr. Horn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you. Uh, we have seen you in Israel, and we've seen you here, and you are very rational about these issues. So I'd like to ask a couple of things. You have a peace movement in Israel. We have peace movements in the United States. And uh, we talk about inspectors that might do something uh, if uh, Saddam does let us in. Could you tell me? what you would tell those people in both Israel and the United States. Uh, are they just naive or what? A lot of them uh, uh, mean very well, I'm sure, but uh, that doesn't solve the problem. Well, I, I, think there is, I think there's a confluence of opinion right now in Israel, uh, Mr. Horn. I think the, there's been a sea change in opinion in Israel uh, in the last two years. Uh, there was never a peace camp because the entire country was united in the desire for peace. But there were different ideas on how to achieve it. Uh, the idea that animated Oslo was that uh, the peace with our uh, Palestinian neighbors would be achieved not by the traditional method of uh, deterrence, which is uh, what I think you can do with a dictatorial society opposite you, a dictatorial regime. It was uh, based on the idea that you could develop trust with a dictatorship uh, and forego deterrence. Uh, and in order to develop this trust, we gave, uh, the, Israel, uh, the Israeli government at the time, gave Arafat uh, a large uh, uh, swath of territory uh, girding our, uh, and overlooking our major cities, gave him a small army, gave him uh, uh, 50,000 uh, rifles, uh, gave him international recognition, access to uh, a great deal of money. And in exchange, he made two promises. One is that he would uh, recognize Israel and forego the propaganda for its destruction. And the second is that he would abandon terror. Uh, he pocketed all these, uh, uh, these benefits and then proceeded to summarily violate these two commitments. Uh, his state-controlled press, every word, every image that you hear and see in the Palestinian media is controlled by Arafat, uh, was propounding day in, day out in Arabic the doctrine of policide, the destruction of a state, our state, Israel, to um, uh, a generation of uh, Palestinian youngsters, to everyone. Uh, and uh, secondly, of course, proceeded to launch the worst and uh, most consistent uh, uh, campaign of terror that the world has seen. Nothing compares to the horror of September 11th. No single terrorist action in history has compared to it, and I hope nothing will ever compare to it again. But there is equal unprecedented, uh, lack of precedence for the uh, day in, day out uh, carnage that Arafat uh, had meted on us uh, with the savagery of suicide bombings carried out by people who graduated his suicide kindergarten camps, suicide universities, who visited his suicide museums and so on. Uh, so people woke up. They now say, we were wrong. Many people, I can't say all, but I'd say, uh, just by reading the, uh, reading the public opinion polls, talking to people in Israel, this is a, a tremendous unanimity in the country. Uh, and I think uh, they're not fooled. They understand that Arafat is, a, is essentially an Osama bin Laden with good PR. Well, medium PR. You know, it's not that good. At least in America, it doesn't go very far. It has a fire, wider reach in Europe. But I think uh, many in America have seen through him. I don't think he gets the time of day here. And, uh, and I think it's a question of time before he's ousted. I hope he, he should have been ousted, in my opinion, 
right at the start of this outrage two years ago. Uh, but uh, I fully agree with uh, President Bush when he says that, uh, uh, that Arafat has to go. There has to be the opportunity for other leaders to rise. Uh, so I, I think in Israel today, actually, I see a lot more unanimity than uh, before. And I, I see, frankly, notwithstanding the confines of a debate in a democratic society, I see a similar process here in the United States following September 11th. Uh, my friend, um, whom I respect a great deal, the uh, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, writer uh, Charles Krauthammer said that in the 1990s, uh, America slept and Israel dreamed. And he said that on uh, September 2000, Israel woke up with the uh, beginning of the terror campaign launched against it. And a year later, in September 2001, America woke up with uh, the bombing of uh, New York and Washington. Um, I, I think that reflects what has taken place in our democratic societies. I'm not sure the same applies with equal vigor to other parts of the democratic world, but uh, I think it doesn't matter. Europe never had a stellar record in understanding global threats, threats to Europe itself, and acting in time to thwart them. But the United States and Israel have a pretty good record, and it's because the people unite uh, in their understanding of the danger and their willingness to act against it. What do you think of the inspector's approach? Uh, did it uh, do much uh, before he just moves things around? It did some, but it's a cat and mouse game, and he, he's the cat. And he's successful, success, uh, successful cat. It is not very difficult to, uh, uh, to deceive inspectors. It's not even very difficult to deceive satellite inspection. You can burrow tunnels and hide, uh, uh, hide the earth. Did you ever see The Great Escape, the movie The Great Escape? Remember that movie? You know, where all these guys come out and they have the, the sand uh, which they distribute uh, through the, uh, the trousers while they're walking the yards. That's essentially what uh, dictators do. They can create uh, tunnels and uh, labyrinths that you'd never discover that are impervious to radar and other means. They can, uh, uh, when you have an entire country to hide uh, portable uh, centrifuges that are a little bigger than those two cameras, it's not very difficult. You can get away with it. Uh, and he has gotten away with it, frankly. Thank you. Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sir, I just want to revisit something that Mr. Kucinich brought up earlier. Now, I think you mentioned in your own comments that uh, Iran is uh, much more further along the path on uh, throw power or ability uh, to move a, a nuclear or other uh, rocket toward the United States than is Iraq. Am I right? It more developed than Iraq. Than, uh, than Iraq. Uh, than Iraq, yes. Right. But Iraq is uh, and I trying to catch up. Well, we also know that there is speculation that Iran may have nuclear uh, weapons or be moving much further along, but we know that Iraq, in fact, is still floundering around looking for materials in order to move in that direction. Right. I, I don't know that Iran has nuclear weapons. Okay. No, I don't think anybody does do, but there's speculation on that. And, but we also we know, at least as certain as we can possibly know, that Iraq is still looking for some materials in order to try to get to that point. Mm -hmm. right. We have information, it was reported in the Washington Post and other papers, that Iran shelters dozens of al-Qaeda fighters identifying the cities of Mashhad and Zabal, if I'm saying that properly, yet we have the administration telling us they don't have any firm evidence uh, that there's any connection between Al-Qaeda or the acts of September 11th in Iraq. So I guess I want to ask you again, in, in light of those comparisons or whatever, why is it that you think uh, that our, if all of these countries, in your words, are problems for us, why you would pick Iraq first as opposed to Syria, uh, Iran, or the others? Well, I think that uh, it's not the first, it's the second. The first one was the Taliban. Now the question is, what is the second? Uh, I think... Well, excuse me one second. Uh, you're making a connection between the Taliban and Iraq? Yes, I am. I'm saying that the, uh, if you look at those who harbor terrorists uh, and those who uh, support terrorists... Uh, and no, support I guess I was looking for a connection between September 11th and my understanding why we went to the Taliban is there was a connection there. They were harboring somebody that we believed did the act on September 11th. Yes, that's the first reason why right. you did it. Now you're going to take me from September 11th to Iraq somehow? 
Yes, but I'm saying something else. I'm saying the connection is not whether Iraq was directly connected to September 11th, but how do you prevent the next September 11th? That is, you have here um, a system or, or a, sub, a subset of the international system that simply disavows any constraints on the use of power. It has fueled these handful of regimes and the uh, terrorist organizations that they harbor are fueled by uh, a, a terrible anti-Western zealotry, a militancy that knows no bounds, doesn't respect any force, knows no limits to the use of power. And one uh, would be Iran, you said? One is Iran, one Which is, is Iraq. More yes. nuclear capacity, more rocket capacity than Iraq in harbors Al-Qaeda people, or at least... Yes, now the question, the, the question you have is this. The question you have is this. This is now a, a question of, uh, uh, not of values, uh, obviously, we like to see a regime change, at least I would, in Iran, just as I would like to see in Iraq. The question now is a practical question. What is the best place to proceed? It's not a question of whether Iraq's regime should be taken out, but when should it be taken out? It's not a question of whether you'd like to see a regime change in Iran, but how to achieve it. Iran has the, uh, something that Iraq doesn't have. Iran has, for example, 250,000 satellite dishes. It has uh, internet use. I once said to uh, uh, the, chair, the heads of the CIA when I was prime minister that if you want to uh, advance regime change in Iran, you don't have to go through the CIA cloak and dagger stuff. Uh, what you want to do is, uh, uh, is take very large, very strong transponders and just beam Melrose Place and Beverly Hills 2050 and all that into into Tehran and into Iran because that is subversive stuff. They watch it, the young kids watch it, the young people, they, they want to have the same nice clothes and the same houses and swimming pools and so on. Uh, and that is something that is available in uh, forces, internal forces of dissension that are available in Iran, which is paradoxically probably the most open society in that part of the world. It is a lot more open than Iraq, which is probably the most closed society on Earth. And therefore, you have no ability to foment uh, uh, this kind of dynamic inside Iraq. So the question now is, choose. You can, uh, you can beam <laughs> Melrose Place, but it may take a long time. On the other hand, if you take out Saddam, Saddam's regime, I guarantee you, that it will have enormous positive reverberations on the region. And I think that people sitting right next door in Iran, young people, uh, and many others will say, the time of such regimes, of such despots, is gone. There is a new age, something new is happening. And that Iraq, is speculation on your part, or you have uh, some evidence to that effect? Uh, you know, I was, uh, I was asked the same question in, uh, in 1986. I had uh, uh, written uh, a book in which I had said uh, that the way to deal with uh, terrorist uh, regimes, well, with terror, was to deal with the terrorist regimes. And the way to deal with the terrorist regimes, among other things, was to uh, apply military force against them. To the way we them. did in uh, Afghanistan. The way, for example, I, I want to answer your question. Well, I guess Mr. I'm running out of time, so I quickly was trying to get there. We've done, I think, what you proposed in Afghanistan, yet I haven't seen that sort of neighborhood effect. Well, I think, I think there's been an, an enormous effect. Uh, the effect was, we were told that there would be uh, a contrary effect. First of all, people said that there would be tens of thousands of people streaming into Afghanistan, zealots who would be outraged by America's action, and this would produce a counter reaction in the Arab world. But I think what you're happened, not saying that when you take an action like we did in Afghanistan, we're going to see all the other countries just fall. No, no what we saw happen. is something else. First of all, we saw everybody streaming out of Afghanistan. The second thing we saw is all the Arab countries and many Muslim countries trying to side with America, trying to make to be okay with America. The application of power is the most important thing in winning the war on terrorism. If I had to say, what are the three principles of winning the war on terror? It's like, what are the three principles of real estate, the three L's, location, location, location? The three principles of winning the war on terror are the three W's, winning, winning, and winning. The more victories you amass, the easier the next victory becomes. The first victory in Afghanistan makes the second victory in Iraq that much easier. The second victory, in Iraq will make the third victory that much easier too, but it may change the nature of achieving that victory. May. It may be possible to have implosions taking place. I don't guarantee it, Mr. Turney, but I think it makes it more likely, uh, and therefore I think the choice of Iraq is a good choice. It's the right choice. Yeah. Ms. Uh, <coughs> Barella? Mr. Yes, Mar thanks, Mr. Chairman. Right. 
Thank you, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. I'm wondering about uh, your understanding, sir, of uh, the enmity among the main uh, Iraqi factions, uh, the Shias, the Sunnis, the Kurds, and how difficult do you think that rebuilding Iraq would, would be given these particular factions? Uh, and I wonder, do you think that uh, a U.S.-led redevelopment of Iraq would significantly further destabilization in the Middle East? So what happens? I, I was asked uh, by you and by others, what would happen after the ouster of Saddam? And I think that this is a, a vital question, because I think it depends on what the U.S. does. If the U.S. merely goes in, throws out Saddam, and walks away, I think it will miss an important opportunity and actually uh, not affect the true meaning of regime change. When I use the word regime change, I mean, I mean uh, those words in their most fundamental meaning. Regime change, change the nature of the regime. That is, not replace one dictator with another, but replace dictatorship with democracy, or at least with democratization. This is the great opportunity that would be afforded uh, to the Middle East, to the prospects of peace and development, to the Iraqi people themselves, and to others. That is, if the United States, after ousting Saddam, uh, seeks to advance a democratized Iraq, couples those political goals with an economic uh, uh, package, to rebuild the infrastructure of Iraq, to uh, uh, advance it, to give, uh, create small business grants and loans, to uh, create the uh, spirit of entrepreneurship that have very much characterized Iraq for many, many decades, actually for many centuries, then Iraq could be transformed. It, could, uh, it may not be, it may not become uh, a Western democracy. I'm not Pollyannish about it. But when people say it's not possible to have uh, uh, democracy in a Muslim country, I say, oh, really? What about Turkey? And I say, well, okay, Turkey is not necessarily Luxembourg, that's true, but if I have to choose between Turkish-style democracy and Iranian-style theocracy, uh, or Saddam-style uh, democracy, where he gets 99% of the vote, uh, then I know what I choose and what you would choose, too. So I think that's really the task. The task and the great opportunity and challenge is not merely to affect the ouster of the regime, but also to transform that society and thereby begin to the process of democratizing the Arab world. I think that's absolutely essential. Uh, and I think we can draw lessons, uh, Congressman Morella, from uh, uh, the struggle that the democracy is led by the United States waged against another unreformed despotism with a, a militancy that knew no bounds to the use of force. I'm talking about, of course, the battle against uh, Hitlerism. Now, America, first, the first thing it said was, we have to oust Hitler. They didn't say, what will happen afterwards? How will we deal with Germany? Will it, uh, you know, all the questions that come to mind later, they never asked that. Because the first thing, the danger, the palpable danger of this regime and that particular regime acquiring nuclear weapons was in their minds, and, and the threat to our civilization was in their minds. So first he had to go. But they didn't stop there. They went in there. They imposed, actually, limitations on German sovereignty, some of which uh, last to this very day. They put in the Marshall Plan. They had democratic uh, elections, a transition to the permanent uh, political, democratic political system that we have uh, in Germany today. And now, five, six decades later, when you ask, what is the protection against the reemergence of neo-Nazism, of a new Hitler in Germany? It is not American tanks. It is not uh, NATO soldiers. It is. German democracy. There are neo-Nazis there, but they're simply washed away by democracy. We have a situation where the Arab world uh, is cloistered. It doesn't have that ventilation. It has to choose between uh, Saddam and the Ayatollahs, between Arafat and the Hamas. And I think the, that the greatest achievement, the greatest change would take place, and the greatest long-term protection against the return of another Saddam, another bin Laden, another Mullah Omar, and after Arafat is ousted, another Arafat. I think the greatest protection is to ventilate these societies with the winds of freedom. Democracy, or if I want to be realistic, democratization, coupled with an economic package. I think that should be the step against uh, afterwards in Iraq. And I think it would actually stabilize Iraq 
it might send a message, I think it will, to neighboring Iran, to neighboring Syria, and the people will wake up and they'll say, we can have a real life. We can have choice. Our children can have a future. But could That's we not a bad it? idea. But can we do it alone? Can, yeah, if you want to, you could do it alone, but I don't think you will do it alone, frankly. I think that uh, uh, you won't do it alone for the simple reason that uh, in these circumstances, when you lead, others will follow. If you wait for them to join you, you'll never lead and they won't follow. Lead, they'll follow. Thank you. Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Net Netanyahu, you uh, said earlier that you didn't like to be quoted, but I'm going to quote you from a speech you gave before a Senate committee in April. Uh, quote, clearly the urgent need to topple Saddam is paramount. The commitment of America and Britain to dismantle this terrorist dictatorship before it obtains nuclear weapons deserves the unconditional support of all sane governments. Um, many analysts believe that the Gulf War ignited Islamic terrorist uh, groups. If Saddam is toppled, will this action inflame Arab animosity toward the West and serve to empower terrorist groups throughout the Middle East? And in your opinion, do you really believe uh, that Saddam can, can be removed from office without compounding terrorist forces? Uh, Mr. Clay, I, I happen to be an analyst who thinks that what is uh, spread and inflamed uh, Islamic fundamentalism are the uh, twin events that took place 20 years ago. One is the establishment of the overt, uh, overtly Islamic Republic of Iran that uh, fanned the flames of uh, militant Islamism uh, from the Philippines to Los Angeles uh, worldwide, infecting, uh, uh, unfortunately, a minority of Muslims, but in many, many communities. Uh, and the second uh, event was the victory of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan over a superpower, thereby convincing uh, these, this, uh, if you will, this uh, brotherhood of Islamic fighters, of which bin Laden was one, that uh, the power of fanatic uh, Islam could overcome any power, including that of a superpower. I think these are the, the things that fueled, that rocketed, of uh, Islamic fundamental, uh, fundamentalism and militant Islamic terror uh, to their present proportions. I think that what compresses it uh, is exactly the opposite of what uh, fueled it. What fueled it was a sense of victory. What compresses it is a sense of defeat. The crucial thing that drives the spread of militant Islam and militant Islamic terrorism is hope. It is hope that the doctrine will be able to achieve its designs of world domination and the crushing of enemies. The more that hope grows, the more militant Islam and militant Islamic terror grows. The more it is crushed, the more it compresses, the more, uh, 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 the, in the same proportion, the ability of these terrorists and these militants to reduce, to uh, um, uh, recruit uh, new recruits to their cause, that too is reduced proportionately. Uh, I began to say to, uh, 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 to uh, uh, Mr. Turney, I think, that, uh, uh, or to, um, I think it was Mr. Turney, he asked me, well, you know, how do you know? And I said that in 1986, I wrote a book that said that you should take action against uh, terror regimes, uh, and that would uh, tend to compress them and um, their activities. And... Uh, Apparently, it turns out that President Reagan had read this book. Now, I don't know if he read it before he decided to strike Libya or after, but uh, nevertheless, uh, Secretary Schultz wrote to me and he said that this made a profound impression on him. Somehow, word got out that uh, uh, I had something, so I was advocating this. So, after the United States bombed Libya, I was interviewed by uh, uh, CBS, by Mr. Rather, Dan Rather. He interviewed me and he interviewed uh, a noted Arabist analyst. And he asked, what would happen now after this American bombing of Libya? And the uh, Arabist, I think it was Patrick Seale, said uh, there will be more terrorism. Terrorism will grow. The uh, Islamic masses would be inflamed. American embassies would be burnt. Gaddafi would become a hero. And he would uh, make more terrorism. I think I'm giving him a fair paraphrasing of his remarks. Then Mr. Rather asked me, what, what do I think would happen? And I said, nothing. Nothing would happen. American embassies would not be burnt. 
uh, Gaddafi would crawl into his hole. He would be very careful in uh, committing any more terrorist acts, not because he's not a terrorist, but because he might die. He almost did in that raid. Uh, and, uh, and people will respect American power. And in fact, what uh, that single action did was to produce uh, uh, a complete cessation, nearly a complete cessation, of uh, terrorism from uh, Libya. Uh, he tried one clandestine act, was caught in the process, and of course didn't do anything since. Uh, but Libya has avoided this because of that action. Uh, in short, what I'm arguing is that the application of American resolve and force, preferably with other countries, but the application of that force against militant Islam and against uh, uh, militant Islamic terrorism is the only way to compress it. There is no other way to compress it. But I'm also arguing that at the long run, what you have to do is to get at the sources of fanning the hatred. The sources that fan the hatred are the regimes that propagate the creed. And where else, where better to begin the process of changing these regimes where in the, than in the places where you're going to change them anyway? Uh, you can go, of course, to other places in the Arab and Muslim world in which you're not engaged directly in a conflict today. I would not advise that. I would say use the opportunity of uh, eliminating the nuclear threat from Iraq uh, and begin a regime change there. Uh, use the opportunity of a regime change in what I call Arafatistan, when we have a new regime there, to uh, begin a process of democratization, a process of uh, economic uh, uh, reconstruction and, uh, and open opportunity, political and economic, for the people. Use that in order to begin to change the political culture that is so cloistered and closed, have it ventilated. That ultimately is the protection. Uh, and I think that will create not the inflaming of masses, but the dousing of the hatred that is, uh, 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 that is systematically sprayed from, the, uh, uh, from the, the, these regime centers. Thank you. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Uh, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, I, I would just like to ask, it seems pretty obvious on its face that, <clears throat> but I'm going to ask this question, why is uh, Saddam Hussein uh, creating these weapons of mass destruction? Uh, why is he in such a rush to get his hands on nuclear weapons? He doesn't have a means to deliver, those, uh, to deliver a, a, a nuclear weapon, um, but um, it seems to me that uh, he, has, he has some plans, he has some goals. Uh, what, uh, as I said, it's pretty obvious, uh, but it seems like there are those who uh, probably don't understand his intentions. Um, I think some of our, our allies, uh, and I, if you look at the situation uh, with the United Nations, um, he has uh, continued to, uh, uh, to deny them um, the opportunity uh, for inspections. Um, so um, uh, it seems like that um, there's a good reason uh, for why he is persisting in this course. Mr. Lewis, he's not developing those weapons to win the Peace Prize. Yes. Where do you think uh, he, would, uh, he would be more likely to direct those weapons uh, through a terrorist organization? It depends on how, uh, uh, and, uh, how uh, confident he feels. Uh, just imagine if he had, suppose he had a nuclear weapon, suppose we hadn't knocked out the, uh, the uh, Osirak reactor and he had developed, and he would have developed by um, uh, the, 19, uh, the late uh, 70s or the late uh, 80s, he would have developed a nuclear bomb a lot before that. All right, now he uh, devours, uh, um, he devours uh, Kuwait, which he did. It's not clear to me that we would have had a Gulf War because he would brandish that weapon right up front. He'd say, go ahead, make my day, or whatever he would say. Okay? And uh, of course, the United States would now be caught in a tremendous bind. Because if he had that weapon, he doesn't necessarily need, in the age of terrorism, he doesn't need uh, ballistic missiles to, read, uh, to reach the United States. First of all, he's developing ballistic missiles. But he could uh, equally uh, use terror proxies to deliver a payload here. I uh, had said, uh, uh, had written in, in 1996, that the danger of militant Islam and these regimes and the terror organizations is not understood in the West. And I said that 
because of the pro proliferation of these adherents in the West, then these regimes do not need ICBMs because they, the terrorists, will be the delivery system. They themselves uh, could deliver a payload. And I, I said too, and here again, I'm, you're ca catching me quoting myself because, well, uh, people like to quote themselves. <laughs> what can I do? Uh, I said that the next thing you will see is not a, a, a car bomb in the basement of the World Trade Center. I said the next, next thing you'll see is a nuclear bomb in the World Trade Center. Well, I wasn't exactly right. They didn't use a nuclear bomb. They used uh, uh, two airplanes uh, stocked with fuel. It's like a small, uh, a small uh, tactical bomb. Uh, that's what they used, and that's what Saddam could use. Once he has the weapon, he has the choice. He could uh, flaunt it. He could use it. He could, not, he could let others use it. He could have uh, uh, delivery systems in the West that do not require missiles. He could put it on top of a missile. Do we want to wait? Is the issue that we want to wait and find out? Do we have any doubt that he's developing? To be honest and fair, and I must be honest and fair, this is not a court of law. This is not a question of, of legalisms. It's a question of a realistic assessment of a threat, a palpable threat to our common civilization. There is no question whatsoever that Saddam is seeking and is working and is advancing towards the development of nuclear weapons. No question whatsoever. And there is no question that once he acquires it, history shifts immediately. I'll give you an example to drive this point home. And I'll do something that, uh, uh, well, I'm a private citizen, so I'll say this. <laughs> Now, just imagine, imagine that the Taliban takes over Pakistan. Pakistan is alleged to have nuclear weapons. Now, imagine that the Taliban would have atomic weapons. Imagine that you could forestall it. Would you forestall it, Mr. Lewis? Don't you think this is a catastrophic development? Absolutely. You see, all nuclear proliferation is bad, but some of it is a lot worse. Right. If Holland acquires nuclear weapons, it is not the same thing as the Taliban or Saddam or uh, uh, Iran, the Ayatollahs acquiring nuclear weapons or Gaddafi. It is fundamentally different because these regimes have no compunction whatsoever in the use of these mass weapons. Saddam himself has shown that he was willing to gas people, one of the few instances since the 1920s when gas warfare was used. You cannot rely on the uh, concerns, on the, on the, I would say, on the uh, uh, mechanisms that inhibit the use of these weapons that apply elsewhere. Even in non-democracies, there are such inhibitions. What you have here are single-man regimes, typically, without the political, military, and scientific buffers that always uh, provide a hedge between uh, the leadership and pressing that button. Here, it's Saddam's whim. He decides, he pushes the button. Right. He has a, a peculiar way of resolving issues like that. And uh, during the Gulf War, there was a, a, a debate, a problem of some uh, medical shortages. He was sitting in the cabinet uh, room, and he called the health minister to the other room, and he killed him. Well, I think we he can... can press the button. He can press the trigger. The emergence of nuclear weapons, that is regimes, single-man regimes or uh, zealot, tyrannical, terroristic regimes that acquire nuclear weapons is an enormous threat to our civilization. I cannot stress that enough. And I'm not speaking here as a partisan. Because in Israel, we don't have a decision. Am I speaking as an Israeli? Yes. But I'm speaking here as a citizen of the free world is a citizen of a world that is entering dangers that are not yet understood. It is not important that we meet here in 10 years, and I will say, I will quote what I said here today, because, because if they had nuclear weapons on September 11th, we couldn't meet here. Well, you know, I think, um, I think the question was asked after 9-11 last year, why didn't we know and why didn't we do something? And I think we can be forgiven for being caught off guard the first time. But I don't think we can be forgiven when we know, we absolutely know, 
that a man like Saddam Hussein has that kind of power and has all the will to put them in the hands of put those weapons in the hands of terrorists, and we don't do something about it, I don't think we can be forgiven for that. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Uh, Ms. Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sitting here and I'm very troubled. We were attacked a year ago on 9-11 by what we thought was a group called Al-Qaeda led by Osama bin Laden. I don't hear his name anymore. We launched a response to an attack on continental United States. I don't hear his name anymore. We have not won a war in Afghanistan. We don't know whether Osama bin Laden is dead or alive. No one has given us any proof. We don't know where the Al-Qaeda cells are around the globe. And all of a sudden, we're no longer looking for I think they pulled off a brilliant scheme. Our, the most uh, prestigious intelligence group in the world could not warn us, and we did nothing. So I'm troubled, because we've won no war against the terrorists. It seems to me that we're focusing on somebody who is in a neighborhood who has weapons of mass destruction, but the circumstances could describe India, Pakistan, in their squabble over Kashmir, Iran, and several other places in the world. But we're focusing on Saddam Hussein and Iraq. There is an orderly process that seems to be overlooked in all of this. And I was very fascinated to hear Kofi Annan today. And in essence, he was saying that only the United Nations can give any legitimacy to any type of action by one country against another. We tried to change the leadership in Cuba. We had the Bay of Pigs, if you remember, trying to go after Fidel Castro. He's only 90 miles off our coast. Now we're trying to choose a new regime and a new leadership in Iraq. There's no guarantee that we're going to gain a democratic leadership in Iraq. But what really troubles me is that we're going to go against the orderly process, a diplomatic effort, and we're going to be come aggressors in a neighborhood that we're not even part of. Uh, listening to you, uh, Secretary, I would think, or Prime Minister, excuse me, listening to you, I would think that you're building up a great case for Israel to be the aggressor, and we are your allies. But as a member of the United Nations, we then will violate the process that we bought into. And that is very troubling to me. Oh, I know all about the danger that Iraq presents. But I don't know, and I feel very uncomfortable in going this alone without the support of the United Nations, since we and you are a member of the United Nations. We violate the orderly process. Would you comment, please? Yes, well, I, I think the first question is, do you want to merely avenge September 11th, or do you want to win the war on terror? If you want to stop with uh, September 11th, go after Al-Qaeda. Can you connect the dots for me between yes, yes. the aggressors on 9-11, the aggressors? No, I'm saying that if you fight no, a multiform... No, this is my question. I'll, I'll answer it. I think that if you... I think, uh, uh, Ms. Watson, there is... Uh, there are now uh, developing enormous threats 
not merely to Israel. Israel is attacked because it's seen as a front line, a frontal position of the United States. They hate us because they hate you. They don't hate you because of us, that too. But the main reason they hate us uh, is because they've hated you. And for these militants, they've hated you for about two centuries and the West for about uh, five centuries. Uh, so uh, there is a hatred of the United States. That hatred has produced that attack, that attack uh, by bin Laden. Uh, is something that you want, obviously, to, to punish. Uh, and in many ways, um, you uh, did the first thing that is required. You took down the Taliban regime, uh, and now bin Laden is uh, scattered. Uh, I don't think he's going to be effective because he needs territory to work from. He's on the run. It's very hard to, to work when you're on the run when you have no inviolable territory. I suppose he's uh, like uh, a kind of a Dr. Goebbels after the collapse of uh, the Nazi regime. So apprehending him is obviously important. Uh, it's also a matter of justice, just as apprehending Goebbels was a matter of justice. But if you start taking away the regimes that could serve his purpose, for example, I was told by your members here that Al-Qaeda, as some of them are in Iran, take, deprive that base. Uh, th there is no international terrorism of any kind. Uh, Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, Hamas, you name them, all of them. Uh, there is no international terrorism if you take away the support of sovereign states, and the sovereign states are a few. If you want to win the war, you just have to neutralize these states. In neutralizing them, you have two options. It's like when kamikaze fighters are coming at you and bombing you. Uh, you can shoot one, you can shoot the other, but if you really want to, if you really want to uh, stop it, you have to shoot down the aircraft carriers. There are only a handful of aircraft carriers. Now, when I say shoot down, you have really two options. You can either deter or destroy. Saddam has not been deterred. He has not been deterred. He's not been deterred by, uh, by inspections. He's not been deterred by, uh, even by your threats. He devoured, uh, he devoured Kuwait like that. And once he possesses nuclear weapons, I assure you, he won't be deterred. You'll be deterred. That's the difference. So I think if you want to win the broader war on terror, you have to get rid of these uh, these regimes. Now, the question you ask, and I think it's an important one, is you say, well, what about the UN? The UN is the one that should give you uh, the, the uh, so the, uh, I think you said, the, the legitimacy. And I think Kofi Annan, who happens, uh, personally, I'm <laughs> very close to him and a friend of his, but <laughs> I take issue with his claim today that the UN offers, only the UN offers unique legitimacy. Well, <laughs> yeah, it offers something unique. I mean, this is an organization where Libya is chairing the Commission for Human Rights and where uh, Syria chaired the Security Council. Uh, it is a fact that the UN has failed time and again, failed time and again to act uh, against aggression in time, often in fact siding with the aggressions. And the reason that is the case is something that was seen over two centuries ago by a great thinker like Immanuel Kant. He said, uh, uh, that an amalgamation of dictatorships and uh, democracies together would not protect peace because dictatorships tend towards war and only democracies tend towards peace. And he was right. Uh, and the UN, unfortunately, is such an amalgamation, so it fails. It failed in the case of preventing Saddam from almost acquiring a nuclear uh, bomb. And when we bombed that, the UN attacked us. By the way, I said that the entire world condemned us. But that is not exactly true, because I'm told that in the uh, sort of in the bowels of the of some of the main uh, security uh, organizations of the U.S. government, uh, they were following this when we struck at Osirak. And at the time, uh, Saddam was calling. It was never used the name Israel. He always said the Zionist entity. Uh, I think the uh, uh, the movie. Uh, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, or the, uh, uh, sorry, the, um, uh, the Empire uh, Strikes Back was uh, making its heyday then. So anyway, when they heard that Israel had uh, struck at Iraq, they said, hooray, the entity strikes back. But nevertheless, the formal position of the United States, the formal position of the UN condemned Israel, was about to place sanctions on Israel. So the UN, in this case and in many cases, simply has not been able to overcome the debilitating weaknesses inside it that, notwithstanding the goals and ideals of the Charter, uh, hobble its ability to be effective in stopping aggression. Aggression has been stopped in the last 100 years, not by the UN and not by the League of Nations, its predecessor. It simply crumpled and died effectively in the, the mid-30s, unable to stop totalitarian aggression. Aggression has been stopped only when the key democratic countries were able and willing to act. When they were unable and unwilling to act, 
uh, no international structure was sufficient. That happened in the first half of the 20th century. It must not be allowed to happen in the first half of the 21st century. And I think we're fortunate to have the United States, whose people and leadership, and I think a broad swath of leadership, uh, a bipartisan leadership, uh, understand that this aggression has to be stopped and stopped in time. May I just Mr. follow up with this uh, one last question? Well, OK. Yeah. Uh, so that I might quote you accurately, are you saying that we are to circumvent the United Nations and uh, not seek a legitimate process through the United Nations, but that the United States needs to go it alone? I just want you to clarify what you're saying in yes, response I'm to my saying, question. I'm saying that you can seek uh, UN support, and it would be good to have it, but I wouldn't make it a precondition of uh, uh, eliminating the uh, Saddam's regime before it acquires nuclear weapons, because if you make it a condition, you'll never reach it. Mr. Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your very generous five-minute rule here. And um, let me Is say... Is the five-minute rule on you or on me? I'm sorry. No, no, I... I uh, uh, I'm just not familiar I, 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 with House excuse rules. Excuse me. He's taking a little poke at the chairman, but that's all right. No, no, we I'm understand. not taking a poke at the chairman. <laughs> I'm just Mr. trying Shays. to condition him for the fact that I may take ten minutes instead of five. I want to say first uh, to you, Mr. Netanyahu, you have been uh, warning the world, not just the United States, about terrorism for decades. You have had a lonely journey, not unlike Churchill, frankly, in the 30s. I happen to think that you are dead on, and uh, it's a privilege to be able to ask you some questions. But I have a number. Thank you. But I first want to make a statement. We knew that Saddam Hussein had a robust chemical, biological, and nuclear program before the war in the Gulf. We knew he had it after. And we knew that he kicked out the inspectors when we were successfully dismantling his chemical, biological, and nuclear program. We know that for a fact. We also know that he had a delivery system for chemical and biological agents. And uh, while that was more quiet in the past, it is now very clearly public information. Uh, so I am left with drawing this conclusion. Why would the burden have to be on those to say that he's still continuing these programs? Why shouldn't the burden be on those to claim that he stopped? Because no one can give me even a scintilla of possibility that he has changed his mindset and changed his ways. And I'd love a short answer to that because I have some follow-ups. I have nothing to add to your, um, uh, your um, uh, uh, very um, uh, acute reasoning here. Uh, but I do, I do want to say that the last point, one of the points, uh, if we're connecting the dots, is uh, that intelligence, including from defectors, who say exactly what you're saying, that he is absolutely committed, pushing with all his power, to develop these weapons now. So you must ask, OK, uh, if we want to take uh, Newtonian physics, if an object is moving with a certain direction, with a certain momentum, there has to be something that will make him change his mind. What is it, the kicking out of the monitors? No. OK, let me ask you this. In 1981, I was a state legislator. I was frankly shocked that there was a preemptive strike. Uh, I voiced my concern as a state legislator, not that it mattered much, but, uh, but I just, when the press asked me, I said, I'm, I'm shocked by it. One of my first briefings when I got elected in 1987 was my interest in understanding that, um, that raid. And after our people described it to me, I figuratively got down on my knees and said, why didn't we congratulate and thank them for doing it? And this gets into this whole issue, them, in other words, Israel. This gets into this whole issue of preemption. We knew that we had an ally, uh, the Soviet Union, who became our enemy socially, politically, economically, and militarily. We developed, we knew what the threat was, we developed a strategy, and it was reactive. Uh, it was containment, reactive, mutually assured destruction. Now, that went out, clearly went out the window on September 11th. I mean, that was the one question that I didn't have answered. There was no red line. That's what we learned from the terrorists. Now, it strikes me that we have to know the threat, as all three commissions have told us. We have to have a strategy, and then we reorganize. 
it, I don't see how we can come to any other conclusion that the strategy has to be preemptive. And, and I'd say to my, my colleague, the ambassador, who, who I understand where she's coming from, but it strikes me, and I was surprised by my own majority leader being surprised that we can't do preemptive. What other choice is there in combating terrorism if it's not preemptive? And I'll just qualify it with one other th point, uh, color it in a little bit. At that very table, we had a noted scientist who said his biggest fear was that a small group of dedicated scientists could create a biological agent, an altered biological agent that would wipe out humanity as we know it. And I was struck with, we were all struck with the fact that if a country allows that to happen, what are we going to do? Just wait till it happens. It has to be preemptive. Is there any other choice than preemptive? I think not, but I think that there are two, uh, three reasons why that is the case. The first reason is that you have now, um, when you have, here, the, here the, the situation where you have to go through and oust the regime as opposed to deter it. One, you may have a regime that is not deterrable. For example, if it has a pension for suicide, uh, you can't rely on deterrence because if uh, the regime is willing to die, uh, a collective death for the glory of their twisted version, say, of Islam, it's not going to work. Or if there are people within it who are moving in that direction, uh, it's not necessarily, deterrence may not uh, work. The second is a regime that has no, no limits to the use of uh, force, that it's simply uh, completely committed to uh, that force. That, a good example of that is uh, the Nazi regime. No matter what you did to it, as long as it lived, as long as Hitler breathed, as long as that click was there, it simply would not stop. You had to oust it. Uh, and the third uh, situation where you must change the regime is that if you don't, you cannot begin to effect a societal change. I think the removal of the dangers, I don't think you, rely, you can rely on deterrence when it comes to most of the terror network. I think this is what distinguishes it from, uh, say, the communists. Uh, you know, the communists, you could deter. It was very easy. They were very rational. I think they were pursuing an irrational goal, but they pursued it very rationally. Uh, and every time they had to choose between their ideology and their survival, they chose their survival. They backed off. Berlin, whatever, Cuba. Uh, the militant Islamists, you can't rely that they'll make that decision because they could go down with the ship. Uh, they have no compunction of killing as many people uh, on this side of the aisle, but also of quite a few of their own. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, you never heard of a communist suicide bomber, but you, you know, militant Islam produces uh, hordes of them. So when you have a regime, uh, a system uh, that is not susceptible to deterrence, uh, you have no choice but to take it out. But what does taking it out mean? It means, and this is, I think, my answer to you, uh, uh, Congressman Shays, it means that you cannot just have regime removal. You really have to have regime change in, in, in the fundamental meaning of that word. You really have to start changing the mentality, the poison, toxified mentality that these regimes have put into the minds of millions, hundreds of millions. Uh, and, uh, and that is the real task, the great challenge. Now, if you don't, then it's a question of time where you'll have suitcase devices of uh, mass death. You can have uh, biological devices. You can have uh, nuclear devices. It's just a question of time. Let me just and so the, the ultimate protection, and I come back to the example of Germany, the ultimate protection that you won't have it, that you won't have a, a new 